a Band-Aid, but it's actually a sealed adhesive wireless sensor package. You stick it on your chest, just below your throat, and it picks up the signals of COVID-19 affliction. Could be really tricky to detect. The sensor. Thanks for watching Home Biz Billionaire, your global entertainment. If you like it, please subscribe our channel for latest news and movies. developed in hard-hit Chicago by Northwestern University bioelectronics engineers and the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. It has its roots in a project that was all about a wearable stick-on sensor for those recovering from stroke. Once a day you remove the sensor, put it on a wireless charging base, and that's the same time that it syncs data through a nearby iPad via Bluetooth, up to the network via Wi-Fi typically, and into a HIPAA-compliant cloud. And that's where the developers have an algorithm that takes a look at it and looks for signals of COVID-19. Now next up, the developers plan to add blood oxygen sensing, like COVID-19 is knowing what its symptoms are, either before, during, or after the obvious onset of this illness. It's been a real slippery thing to try and characterize that way and detect as it goes through its arc. And yet that's gonna be key to managing. Mr. John Rogers may have some answers for us. He is the director of Northwestern University's Center on Bio-Integrated Electronics, a division of Northwestern that I'm pretty sure didn't even exist when I graduated there back in the mid-80s. John, this sounds like uh, a pretty uh, exciting, innovative part of the school. What's the short background on it? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's kind of a new institute, actually. It's called the uh, Query Simpson Institute for Bioelectronics. So I spent the first part of my academic career at University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, got, got started at Bell Labs, and then moved to U of I in 2003. And so I was recruited to Northwestern in 2016, and part of the recruitment package was to establish this institute to really sort of uh, catalyze efforts at the interface between engineering and medicine, of course, long before this pandemic uh, emerged. And uh, our vision has always been to uh, democratize sort of ICU grade healthcare monitoring capabilities so that you can uh, track patients outside of the hospital, but with the same kind of ICU grade quality of data streams to, to enable remote monitoring, to enable uh, you know, improved care in uh, resource constrained uh, regions of the globe. And so we've been working in that space for the last decade, and it turns out a lot of those technologies are highly relevant. You know, yeah. the COVID-19 and the pan pandemic we're struggling with. I now. find that very concept you've just uh, put into a short phrase there, the idea of ICU-grade monitoring on the person, wherever they may go, to be just full of so many interesting opportunities as we try to get a better handle on how the world's population is doing. And I guess you really had it come right to your door when COVID-19 came out. What does this sensor do? What does it pick up, first of all? Yeah, so it's uh, it's kind of a unique type of platform from, from the electronics hardware standpoint. It's it's a soft and, and flexible type type of device. I kind of have one here. I'm wearing one right now my, myself. Oh, yeah. um, it, it's sort of you know flexible and soft so that it's skin compatible. So you can uh, think about mounting the device on regions of the body other than the wrist, which is where conventional uh, wearables kind of reside and are kind of constrained to. And, uh, you know, the suprasternal notch, which is where this device is located, is sort of soft tissue location at the base of the neck, right where the collarbone sort of joint uh, appears. And it's a very special uh, location if you're interested in respiratory activity. And that that's key to uh, you know, a lot of the symptoms associated with COVID-19. It's cough, it's shortness of breath, fever, of course, uh, but with a device mounted in this location with something you can't do with a traditional uh, wearable, you can um, you know, provide measurement capabilities that allow us to determine um, certain characteristics of underlying physiological processes by measurements of subtle motions of the skin at, at this part of the body. So you can pick up sounds essentially associated with respiration, sounds and characteristics associated with coughing. You can actually pick up heart rate and heart rate variability from the pulse little flow of blood through huh. the carotid artery. So it's a very special location. Uh, we were interested in that device in the context of uh, stroke, uh, stroke survivors and rehabilitation because we measure swallowing and speech and they have to relearn how to mm. swallow and, and speak. 
And so our collaborators downtown were kind of aware across the medical complex downtown, were kind of aware of that platform and reached out to us and asked if we could sort of adapt it, modify it, customize it to COVID symptoms, fever, cough, and respiratory activity. And so that really launched us down a, a, a very rapid uh, you know, paced engineering development activity around the software and the hardware to to adapt it for those purposes. And uh, I think we've we've made a lot of great progress. It's still early. Uh, we're three three weeks into this, but you know we have nearly a terabyte of data. We're on 25 patients and healthcare workers downtown, and it's providing new insights. You know, data that was not previously captured in in any manner, whether whether in the hospital or at the home, coughing and respiratory sounds. Yeah, what's so interesting here is you've gone beyond, we hear over and over about kind of the same two or three signals being gathered by different wearables and used in different ways, but you're picking up something different from somewhere different, the suprasternal yeah. notch you're talking about. Uh, you, well, what's inside there? You've got an accelerometer. You talk about listening for cost, but you don't have a microphone. Is that right? Yeah, I think you know, you could you could conceive of using a microphone to measure coughing, but I don't think anybody would wear a microphone all day long. Yeah, <laughs> it's picking up your conversations and all kinds of privacy issues. So this device is not based on a microphone. It's more like a stethoscope, I guess, like a digital stethoscope, mm. but wireless, skin-like, and it just sits there and records all day long. You know, and uh, we capture a lot of data. It gets uploaded to a, a secure cloud. Uh, and then we put algorithms on top of it to extract these key features, coughing, respiratory rate, respiratory sounds. And we also have a, a very sensitive uh, temperature sensor in, embedded in the device as well. And so, so we capture all this data. So how does the information get off of that into the cloud? Because I'm always fascinated by the ease of use for the end user if something wants to scale. Well, yeah, that's a great question. It's it's typically a topic that we don't spend a lot of time on as an academic research group. We're more interested in discovery around the, the sensing mechanisms and the insights in the, into the data. But, but to have an impact, to get it really deployed on COVID patients, you really have to think about the burden on the patient because these folks are, are sick, right, at, at, the, at the very highest, most serious levels, yeah. right? And so they don't want to futz around with a piece of gadgetry and go through menus and click on icons and stuff like that. It's just not possible. It's also not possible for the, for the healthcare wor workers to futz around with it either because they're busy, right? They don't have time. So, so we had to spend time on thinking about how to make this as transparent and burden-free as possible. So the device goes on, it's a sticker, goes on. Uh, at the end of the day, you pull it off, you drop it onto a charging pad. As soon as the device sees that it's on a charging pad, it automatically initiates a wireless data transfer to an iPad. And then when it lands on the iPad, the iPad automatically sends it up through a cellular connection to a HIPAA compliant cloud. Algorithms are automatically applied to that data. It creates a graphical dashboard that physicians can look at. And so that's that's it. You don't ever have to do anything with the device. You don't have to mess mess around with an app of any sort. When you pull it off the charger, it automatically turns on and starts recording. And so then you mount it back up uh, and that's it. Huh. OK, so it's real simple. Stick it on or charge it. It's kind of got two modes for the user to deal with. Right. Uh, now, let's go to the to, to, to the holy grail here. You just mentioned once the data is offloaded, it goes into your algorithm. This is, of course, where the magic happens, because it seems like, at least to a layperson, picking up some relatively simple signals doesn't seem to get you very far unless you've got some magic you can do with those. What are you doing? Well, I would say two things. One is uh, the algorithms that we have right now are just built on deterministic sort of digital filtering. So math operations just applied to the data. We can extract a coughing event. We can detect those events very, very cleanly. We can separate them from speech and motion and things like that. Same thing with uh, respiration, same thing with hardware. We can do those classifiers. And uh, that's what the physicians wanted, you know, and, and we're responsive to their requests. This is not a technology push it's a clinical pull and so that's what they wanted mm. and that's what we've delivered and uh you know i think in the past they've kind of qualitatively made assessments of whether a patient is coughing more or less one day to the next and try to use that in an overall assessment of health but being able to do it in a quantified manner being able to pick up very early signs of you know light coughing before maybe a patient is even aware of it uh, becomes very powerful and being able to sort of monitor the progression of a patient through various stages of the disease using these novel biomarkers coughing respiratory sounds is is very powerful but 
I think the future is to apply artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to these same data streams to extract deeper insights into what is the nature of the cough, not just whether you coughed or you didn't cough, but what sort of cough was it? Was it a dry cough? Was it a wet cough? Did the patient swallow after the cough? Interesting. Is it, are the coughs occurring in coughing fits or are they just kind of uniformly distributed? Are you coughing more at night than you are during the day? All this kind of information we think could provide additional insights into the basic mechanisms of how the disease is interacting with the body. And I think as a research tool, it could be important in that context. But maybe more importantly, you can sort of make quantitative assessments of where a patient is in terms of their progression through the various stages of the disease. So that's kind of phase two. Phase one is just give the physicians what they ask for. And that's what, what we've done. But then phase two is to really mine this data, right, for, for deeper insights and, and maybe additional meaning. So it sounds like you're going down the path of saying we start early, saying we can detect what we know we're looking for. Right. And then as we go a little further, we can help find out what we should be looking for. Exactly. That's a good way to phrase it. Yeah. Now, you're also talking about an interesting array of patients from one side over here who may have barely any symptoms that are indistinguishable from allergies today to people over on the other side here who are coming out of a hellacious bout with COVID-19. That's a lot of people this seems applicable to. How do you get to scale? What party would take this and run with it, do you think, as you get down the road? Yeah, I mean, we're an academic group, and so we can't scale ourselves, but we would be very willing to work with uh, outside entities who, who were interested in scaling if, if there's the need, right? And so we're just responding on an ad hoc basis to people who have approached us and asked us about capabilities, and uh, I think that's maybe a good way to start. We've been funded uh, in the past by BARDA, which is a federal organization that, that funds this type of work. And Maybe in the end of the day, they become a vehicle for putting the various parties together if, if there were uh, a desire and a need and a pull to, to scale up. I would say there are probably very few challenges, fundamental challenges to doing that. I think it's a much simpler device to manufacture than a ventilator, for example. Yeah. And so the kind of processes are very well aligned with the consumer electronics industry. So there are companies out there who know how to do this. And uh that we'd be happy to, to engage if, if there's the need for, for, for doing, doing that kind of thing. So I, I think there's a clear pathway to scale uh, to very large volumes uh, if that became uh, you know, some, something that, that was needed. Uh, and I think because it's building off of consumer electronics, there's a cost structure there that probably makes sense. I, I don't know that we've done the full bill of materials and you'd have to think about the volumes and so on, but I can't imagine devices costing more than maybe hundred bucks you know, if you were to if you were to scale up, uh, probably less than that, but kind of kind of in that range. So okay, um, yeah. So um, here's the big picture question: You're dealing with one syndrome right now, and this has its roots in dealing with recovery from stroke. So there's a couple of use cases. But as I hear you talking about this, and uh, and I understand there are other functions you can add to it, perhaps a uh, what an oxygen perfusion or blood yeah. perfusion. Yeah, Th this yep. becomes something close to the Star Trek tricorder, but instead of having this big clunky piece of electronics, here's this very almost imperceptible thing we could wear. Down the road, a number of years, shouldn't we all be wearing a package of, as you say, ICU-grade medical sensors as part of everyday life? Isn't that the big goal down the road? Probably, you know, that that's kind of a vision that we've had others as well, you know, over the last decade or so. I think it takes on a whole new level of urgency, right, given given the pandemic and maybe there's a, a broadening awareness of, you know, developing these kinds of capabilities. I think it has uh, the, the potential to really transform the way that we think about healthcare, telemedicine, digitally enabled, you know, patient specific, you know, insights and at home monitoring rather than episodic measurements when people come into a hospital. I think the technology is there, you know, uh, I, I think we and probably others as well, you know, kind of kind of know how to do it. We're, we're engaged in, in uh, global deployments of devices of this general class focused on maternal, fetal, neonatal and pediatric health, just because we think or we used to think that that, that population could benefit most strongly uh, from a wireless sort of continuous monitoring uh, capability yeah. we're deployed in. 15 countries, five continents, several places in Africa funded by the Gates Foundation and huh. the Save the Children Foundation, where there are no monitoring technologies at all. So thinking about, you know, an evolution, I think you know, kind of analogy there is they uh, leapfrog land, landlines straight to cellular. Maybe they go straight to these wireless devices. Forget about the old style, you know, wired ICU 
great monitors. But, but I think it's a very compelling vision for the future and it's a technology enablement that's more or less here. You know, the, the question is just the time scale of, uh, of, of deploying it. I think, I think it can have a lot of utility across a, a range of conditions. So let me uh, let me cut the other way now and play the devil's advocate, which an awful lot of the medical and health community will do. It's a fair amount of tradition there, a fair amount of momentum of doing things a certain way, the way they've been done. And a lot of them will point to AI in general, and you're using something in the AI realm and say, you know, this stuff is so far from being able to do what even a a, a recent medical school grad can do looking at traditional computer screens and even charts. What do you say about the current sort of backlash against AI in health that seems to have cropped up in the last six to nine months? Well, I think it's a good question. Our devices don't rely on AI. Uh, I think AI is a value add, a potential value add in the future. But we work directly with the clinicians, the physicians. We understand that community. We're not trying to push things on them. We're developing devices that are creating data streams that they know are important. Now, what they want to do with that data, they want to put it through a machine learning algorithm to extract insights, find they can do that, or they just want to look at it in the old style method of uh, you know eye inspection and experience. That, that will be their decision. We're hardware guys. And so what we want to do is take all the ICU grade monitoring systems, put it into the home in a way that's completely imperceptible physically and um, not disruptive in any way to, to natural daily activities. And then you'd have a lot of options around what you want to do with that data. We focus on the hardware and clinical grade data. And uh, I think machine learning is a part of that, but it's not uh, kind of at the core. It's, it's not uh, a necessary uh, you know, aspect of, of, of the value add, I guess. Okay, so you hand off what your hardware can detect and it's up to other parties to decide how low or how high, how manual or how futuristic, they want to apply technology to gain insights from it. Yeah, what we've found, and I think is a great, great point you're making, is that you got to show up and engage with the clinicians based on data that they're used to looking at, Yeah, you know, data that they've been trained to understand. You can't show up with a novel metric that they, they've never heard of before. So we try to reproduce what they're doing today, but in a totally different format, wireless, applicable outside of the hospital, on and on. And I think over time, the tremendous data flows that will come naturally from that kind of monitoring will open up opportunities for machine learning. But we're not trying to convince anybody to use machine learning. You don't need to, to, to you, know, uh, uh, you know, realize the benefit of this, this kind of technology. Okay, as we wrap up here, uh, what do you expect is going to happen in the month of May with this project? We're taping today on the 4th of May. Uh, by the end of this month, what do you think will have been learned, accomplished, or moved forward? Well, I think we're going to double up the number of devices that we've deployed. It's still kind of a small number in the, in the grander scheme of things, but we'll go from 25 to 50 probably here in the next uh, couple of weeks. We're very eager to see how these various metrics, these novel biomarkers that physicians know are important, how do they evolve as a patient recovers, for example, or as a patient begins to recover but then deteriorates, right? What are the sp specific you know, insights that we can get around COVID-19 itself. I think that's something that's going to happen very naturally just over the next few weeks. But kind of in parallel with that, this is the first kind of public, you know, announcement of, of what we're doing. And uh, depending on the inbound interest and, and the folks who want to uh, engage, you know, that that will determine to a large extent where, where things go, go in the future. Okay. It's a new sensor. It's flexible. It's adhesive. And as you can see, it's almost imperceptible, it has its roots in working with stroke patients and found a whole new role and spotlight here in the emergence and battle against COVID-19. Thanks for watching Home Biz Billionaire, your global entertainment. If you like it, please subscribe our channel for latest news and movies.